Today we are going to discuss about one of the very important metabolic complication related with the diabetes mellitus. The condition which we are going to discuss today it is called diabetic ketoacidosis. We call it diabetic ketoacidosis right D K A and many of these patients eventually go into coma if they are not managed well right so I will start telling that why this condition develop why people go into diabetic ketoacidosis it means patient has diabetes and in his body in the patient body ketogenesis start ketogenesis mean formation of ketone bodies right and result into acidosis in the patient right patient who is having diabetic situation develops ketogenesis in the body and ketogenesis is so severe that it may lead to acidosis and eventually it may lead to coma right now I will put a question to you that type 1 diabetes all of you know they are primarily diabetes diabetes mellitus is two types type 1 and type 2 type 1 patient have more risk of DKA or type 2 patients have more risk of DKA yes type 1 why very good the most important thing the answer is type 1 patients have more risk to undergo DKA but some of the type 2 patient may also undergo diabetic ketoacidotic coma the most important prerequisite most important event which triggers the ketogenesis is severe or absolute deficiency of insulin right all of you know that in diabetic patient there is either deficiency of insulin or there is deficiency of insulin action but to develop this dangerous condition there have to be severe or absolute deficiency of insulin so most important thing there is severe or absolute deficiency absolute deficiency of insulin now we have to understand why severe deficiency of insulin can precipitate diabetic ketoacidosis and why severe deficiency occur first I will explain why the severe deficiency of insulin action occur and then we will go into detail that how very severe deficiency of insulin can lead to DKA now under what circumstances there can be severe deficiency of insulin action in our body of course number one is type 1 diabetes type 1 diabetes mellitus as you know in type 1 diabetes mellitus main problem is that there is severe reduction in the production of insulin right many times in type 1 diabetic patients diabetic ketoacidosis may be the first presentation for example if uh, there is a person who has type 1 diabetes and immune system has destroyed most of the beta cells of the pancreas and progressively insulin production has gone very much down right and if patient is yet not diagnosed right one day patient may go into diabetic ketoacidotic and to coma and we say this situation this dangerous situation may be one of the initial presentation of type 1 diabetes is that right so number one it may be initial presentation of type 1 initial presentation number two an undiagnosed type 1 patient an undiagnosed type 1 patient right diabetic ketoacidotic coma may be the first presentation secondly this type of problem may also occur when patient has been diagnosed with type 1 but there is some major problem what is now what are the things which can precipitate this problem whenever there is whenever there is 
इंक्रीज डिमांड ऑफ इंसुलिन फॉर एग्जाम्पल योर पेशेंट इज इन टाइप वन डायबिटीज एंड यू हैव स्पेसिफाइड दैट सो मेनी यूनिट ऑफ इंसुलिन पेशेंट शुड गेट एवरी डे एंड पेशेंट इज वेरी फेथफुली टेकिंग इंसुलिन एज यू प्रेस्क्राइब इट मीन्स देर इज नो प्रॉब्लम विद द कंप्लायंस बट ड्यू टू सम रीजन इन द पेशेंट डिमांड ऑफ इंसुलिन एज गॉन अप राइट एंड इफ डिमांड ऑफ इंसुलिन इन द बॉडी एज गॉन सिग्निफिकेंटली अप एंड यू आर नॉट प्रोवाइडिंग एडिशनल इंसुलिन दर इज द रिस्क ऑफ डिवेलपिंग कीटोजेनेसिस राइट फॉर एग्जाम्पल पेशेंट वेर देर इज इंक्रीज फॉर एग्जाम्पल देर इज इंटर करंट प्रॉब्लम इंटर करंट प्रॉब्लम इंफेक्शन मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट सवियर इंफेक्शन इफ अ पेशेंट हु इज ऑन इंसुलिन इंसुलिन डिपेंडेंट डायबिटीज मलाइटस ड्यूरिंग इंफेक्शन और ड्यूरिंग ट्रॉमा और ड्यूरिंग सर्जरी डिमांड फॉर इंसुलिन इंक्रीज एंड इफ यू डोंट इंक्रीज द इंसुलिन टू द पेशेंट देर मे बी रेलेटिव डेफिशियंसी ऑफ इंसुलिन राइट इंफेक्शन सवियर इंफेक्शन लाइक येस रेस्पिरेटरी ट्रैक इंफेक्शन पेशेंट गोइंग टू नमोनिया और यूरिनरी ट्रैक इंफेक्शन और सुवियर गैस्ट्रो इंटेस्टाइनल इंफेक्शन और सेप्सिस और एक्चुअली एनी टाइप ऑफ सवियर इंफेक्शन डिमांड मोर इंसुलिन फॉर द बॉडी इज दैट क्लियर सेकेंडली ट्रॉमा एनी सिवियर ट्रॉमा एंड इंक्लूडिंग सर्जरी डिमांड फॉर इंसुलिन और मोर इज दैट राइट सो इन टाइप वन पेशेंट वाई टाइप वन पेशेंट में गो इन टू कीटोजेनिस वन रीजन इज दैट दे वर नेवर डायग्नोज प्रीवियसली एंड दिस मे बी देयर फर्स्ट प्रेजेंटेशन सेकेंड रीजन इज दैट देवर डायग्नोज केस ऑफ देवर डायग्नोज केसेज ऑफ डायबिटीज टाइप वन एंड दे वर वेरी फेथफुली टेकिंग द इंसुलिन there is no communication gap between you and patient as far as insulin intake is concerned right but due to some intercurrent problem demand for the insulin has gone dramatically up and unfortunately patient doctor communication was not good and additional insulin was not provided and relative severe deficiency of insulin develop which increases the risk for starting ketogenesis is that right so there can be trauma surgery and of course you should not forget any type of extensive infarction in the body of course most commonly myocardial infarction but even in mesenteric infarction even cerebrovascular accidents right they can also demand uh, more insulin and if more insulin is not provided there may be process of ketogenesis starting i will explain how ketogenesis occur i'm just telling under what settings this problem can come right then still i have not put the most important cause of dka i will put a star here and you will tell me the cause which should be written here yes not anyone yes treatment what look i'm saying up to now that dk develop in those patients of type 1 diabetes which are previously undiagnosed and it may be the first presentation or it may develop in those patients of type 1 diabetes who are insulin dependent of course but due to some intercurrent situation demand for insulin is dramatically increased and you fail to provide the additional insulin and the third but the most important thing that yes what is the most important preventable cause of dka what is the most important preventable cause of dka which can be prevented if you do proper patient education about diabetes mellitus failure of taking insulin at all problem with the compliance problem with the compliance sometimes patient don't take insulin patient has been diagnosed patient has been taking the insulin regularly due to some reason patient thinks he doesn't he or she should not take insulin there are people who are not very compliant and they put their life at risk just 
not to be very compliant. So the most important cause which is preventable because if you do a proper patient, patient education, right, that can be prevented, that is a compliance problem, non-compliance, a failure to take insulin, failure to take insulin in those patients who are insulin dependent. Is that right? Classical example are the adolescent patients. Someday they don't take uh, food. For example, this young adolescent he is very angry because the because the girlfriend is not talking. <laughs> so he decide I will not take the food. And because he decide not to take the food, patient think, of course, if I'm not taking the food, I'm not putting the glucose in my body. I should not take the insulin. It is a simple logic. But body does not go with the simple logic. I will tell you later. <laughs> right? So many times, patient, because usually when we are educating the doctors about the diabetes mellitus and insulin, we say you need to have insulin because you need to utilize the glucose in your body. When you take the food, glucose is going to your body. Insulin helps you to use the glucose. When this is not the proper patient education, it's half education. When you tell a patient that we need insulin to utilize the glucose because then patients think okay one day I have not taken the food or some patients think we have taken the food and we vomited due to some reason so we don't need insulin and even there are some patients who think we have taken the food but because these for last eight hours I have diarrhea so they think patients think food is going out why we take insulin <laughs> you are getting it yeah. and they miss the insulin and that's the classic unfortunate situation in which ketogenesis is triggered. As I will tell you later, the part of education to a patient who is insulin dependent patient, you must tell him first half of the information is that you must take insulin regularly so that your body can utilize glucose. But second and most important information is you must never stop insulin under any circumstances if you are insulin dependent to so that ketogenesis does not start. So insulin is required not for one purpose, it is required for two purposes. There are many other purposes, but the minimum you are supposed to tell your patient, number one, you should take regular insulin. If you are insulin dependent, if your body is not producing enough insulin and you are really dependent on insulin, then number one, you should take insulin because we, you have to use, utilize glucose in your body. Insulin helps you to utilize glucose. But very importantly, insulin help you to prevent the ketogenesis because hyperglycemia may not kill the patient rapidly. Hyperglycemia may not kill the patient rapidly, but ketogenesis acidosis does kill the patient rapidly. Is that right? So someone next time in your life, when you come across a patient who is insulin dependent diabetic patient, your most important advice is under any circumstances, never ever stop insulin. Even if you have not eaten, you have to take insulin. It's better to go into hypoglycemia and manage it with the lump of sugar, but it's very bad to undergo ketogenesis and then be in the ICU. Is that right? <laughs> Am I clear? So come out. So most important and preventable cause of the DKA, diabetic ketogenesis, acidotic situation is failure of the patient who is already insulin dependent to take the insulin, to miss the insulin. This is problem with the compliance or some misunderstanding or failure of communication between you and the patient. Is that right? Then these are the situations in type 1 diabetes. Do you think type 2 diabetic patient develop, uh, can develop diabetic ketoacidosis? Yes. Answer is yes. Type 2 diabetes patient can also develop DKA, but they develop DKA less often and less severe. Why? Because in type 1 diabetes, deficiency of insulin is very severe. In type 2 diabetes, deficiency of insulin is moderate or mild, right? Or, so in type 2 diabetes, chances of DKA are less, is it right? And less severe diabetes, uh, DKA occurs in those patients of type 2 diabetes who are insulin dependent at advanced stage, right? But again, the cause is the same that in these patients also, either 
there is some intercurrent situation which has demanded the increase in the insulin, insulin demand is increased or failure to take the insulin. Is that right? Any question up to here? No. Now we come to this situation, we have to discuss why severe deficiency of insulin produces diabetic ketoacidotic coma. So we'll go to the pathogenesis of the DKA. Let's suppose this is the organ system of our body, our patient body rather, here is circulatory system. Right? Here are your body cells. Here I present general body cells, here I put a muscle. Here is your nephron. It's a very simple diagram. Of course, the hero of all this situation is your liver. Central nervous system is also affected. And you should not forget, patient has a gastrointestinal system which may also be involved. So these are different organ systems which play a role in diabetic ketoacidosis. So let's discuss it from the beginning. The problem number one, this severe deficiency of insulin. So real problem is beta cell of the pancreas, they have not working. Most of them are destroyed or they are producing extremely low level of insulin. So patient is insulin dependent. Is that right? You have to give insulin from outside. So when a person has very severe deficiency of insulin, what happens? First we have to talk about it. The problem number one is, of course lungs are also playing a role there. That when there is severe deficiency of insulin, what happens? There is very severe deficiency of insulin. What will happen? Number one, the insulin dependent utilization of glucose will be reduced. Insulin dependent utilization of glucose by the peripheral tissue will be reduced. Classically, there are two tissues which utilize the glucose in the presence of insulin. Number one is, my friend is telling brain, put it, write it here that brain and put a huge cross on it. <laughs> Central nervous system is such an important organ in our body that glucose entry in CNS is not dependent on insulin. Nature is not kept your central nervous system dependent on presence of insulin for utilization of glucose. There are some tissues in our body where glucose can enter regardless of insulin is there or not. Central nervous system is the most important into that. And of course I will not tell you the second very important tissue is your testes. Right? Yes, they can utilize glucose without insulin also. But I will not talk those things. Let's concentrate on our business of today. Uh, the most important, there are many tissues which use insulin, but I would mention at this stage that muscles, muscles have special type of glucose transporters which are called GLUT4. And okay, I make here adipose tissue. What is this? Adipose tissue, they also have uh, GLUT4, glucose transporter type 4. These two tissues are especially very, very sensitive to the presence of insulin. If insulin is there, then they can take up the glucose rapidly. If insulin is not there, they cannot take up the glucose rapidly. Is that right? Now, the first event is when there is insulin deficiency. When there is insulin deficiency, naturally these peripheral tissues are unable to take up the glucose. So there is reduced utilization of glucose. Is that right? Number one problem is there is reduced 
utilization of glucose and naturally glucose level in the blood will go up. That will lead to hyperglycemia. This is problem number one. That peripheral tissue is unable to utilize glucose. Number two, we have to discuss when glucose utilization in the presence of insulin goes down, what goes wrong with the adipose tissue, what goes wrong with the muscles, what goes wrong in liver. But more important than that at this stage is whenever your insulin level is down, there are some other hormones level going up. Is that right? What are those hormones? Glucagon. Very good. This is a balance. Here is your insulin. Is that right? Insulin levels have gone down. And whenever insulin levels are down, there is a group of hormones. We call them counter, counter regulatory hormone. Those hormones level in the blood goes up. Why? Because whenever insulin is down, tissues are not getting glucose. When tissues are not getting glucose, body produces counter regulatory hormone to increase the production and synthesis of glucose. Again, listen. There is something wrong in the body. Normally what happens? First you understand the normal. If I don't take food for for example, I am not getting food for two days. For a long time, I am not getting food. Of course, glucose level in the blood will go down. Of course, insulin will also go down. Then counter-regulatory hormones will be produced in my body. What are those hormones? Glucagon will be produced more. Cortisol will be produced more. Epinephrine will be produced more. Growth hormone will be produced more. Now, what these hormones will be doing? Normally, they are doing good function under these circumstances when body has, you are not, you are in a severe prolonged fasting state. When you are in severe prolonged fasting state, you are not eating, glucose in the blood is progressively going down, insulin is going down, then glucagon goes up. What glucagon and epinephrine and growth hormone and cortisol are doing? These counter regulatory hormone increase glyco, glycogenolysis first. First glycogen start breaking down into glucose. These counter regulatory hormones, let me put it here what they are doing. Number one is glucagon. Number two we have put epinephrine. Then we are putting cortisol. And then we can put growth hormone. Now, these are called counter regulatory hormone. In normal circumstances, right, what, what is happening? Insulin try to keep the blood glucose level low and they are supposed to keep the blood glucose level up and they are counter regulating to each other. They are keeping a balance of glucose level. Is that right? This is their physiological functions. What are their physiological functions? Now we come to the pathology. What is the pathology here? Insulin is extremely low. Because insulin is extremely low, right, and patient is still eating the food, so glucose is going into body, but insulin dependent utilization of glucose is impaired, so glucose is collecting into circulatory system and extracellular fluid, and we say hyperglycemia is developing, number one. Primarily hyperglycemia is due to deficiency of insulin leading to the poor utilization of glucose by the peripheral tissues. Clear? But secondarily, under these circumstances when peripheral tissues are getting less glucose, peripheral tissues assume probably glucose is not there. But actually glucose is there. But in the absence of insulin, many glands and peripheral tissue assume as if there is no glucose. So counter regulatory mechanisms are started and glucagon level goes up. Of course it is produced by the alpha cells of the pancreas. Beta cells produce insulin. Previously they were producing insulin still. So alpha cells of the pancreas start secreting glucagon. Adrenal glands, adrenal medulla and sympathetic nervous system release epinephrine. Adrenal cortex start releasing cortisol and of course anterior pituitary releasing growth hormone. Now, the, we say the ratio of insulin 
versus glucagon ratio. This is disturbed. It is decreased. Is that right? Now due to this disturbed ratio, what will happen? Under the influence of these counter-regulatory hormones, what's going to happen? Number one, in the liver, glycogen start breaking down. So let's suppose this is one cell in the liver and glycogen start breaking down and if glycogen is breaking down into glucose, it means what process has started? Glycogenolysis. So glycogenolysis is stimulated and liver start releasing more glucose. Do you think it's good in these conditions or bad? It is bad because already there's a lot of glucose in the blood and that glucose is not being utilized at the top glycogenolysis start a lot of glycogen is breaking down into glucose is that right in the presence of what glucagon and counter regulatory hormone number two process of gluconeogenesis start and when gluconeogenesis mean formation of glucose from non carbohydrate sources is that right so actually that is also mainly occurring into gluconeogenesis in the liver and glucose is also coming. So glucose is coming to the peripheral blood. Number one, glucose is accumulating due to non-utilization, poor utilization due to absence of insulin. Number two, due to excess of the counter-regulatory hormone, glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis process has started and extra glucose is being released from the liver. This is a situation where liver is doing really flesh thin. Normally liver is supposed to release glucose when there is low glucose level in the blood. But unfortunately here your hepatic glucose reservoir system is fooled. Right? And already there is lot of glucose in the blood due to, due to non-utilization. And now more glucose coming from glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. Is that right? During this, when gluconeogenesis has to start, when gluconeogenesis has to start, then the raw material for gluconeogenesis should be provided to the liver. Because liver is able to produce the glucose from the non-carbohydrate sources. For example, liver can produce glucose from amino acids. Liver can produce glucose from free fatty acid during the pathway of gluconeogenesis. So it means liver requires a good, good supply, additional supply of amino acids and free fatty acid for what? For gluconeogenesis. And they will be also provided by the peripheral tissue. Muscle during these circumstances when there is severe deficiency of insulin and high level of counter regulatory hormone muscles start breaking down in the proteins and in the muscles when proteins break down right into amino acids muscles will release amino acids and these amino acids can be taken to the liver to be utilized in gluconeogenesis right and of course glycogen in the muscle will be also broken down you know in the muscles also Glycogen is there and glycogen in the muscle will be also broken down into which substance? Into? Glucose in the, glycogen in the, listen, my question is, first I will repeat, glycogen in the liver is broken down into glucose and glucose is secreted to blood. Glycogen in the muscle is broken down into glucose or not glucose? It is never broken down into glucose. That is what I want to remember. This is the speciality of liver to break down the glucose, glycogen up to glucose. Glycogen which is present in the muscle that can be broken down up to glucose 6 phosphate. But you can from the glucose molecule 6 phosphate cannot be removed. So muscle do not have the last enzyme which is required to break down glycogen into glucose. So actually in the muscle glycogen break down up to glucose 6 phosphate which enters into glycolysis and break down into lactate into lactate and actually lactate come out. What comes out? Lactate come out. Normally what happens? Glycogen from the muscle glycogen in the muscle 
break down up to lactate and lactate normally come to the liver and liver can can utilize lactate to make glucose through the gluconeogenesis and this lactate can go to the liver come out as glucose through gluconeogenesis pathway and then this glucose can be utilized by muscle you must be knowing this is called cori cycle is that right now presently what is relevant with us that in the muscle glycogen break down and provide lactate to the blood and in the muscle proteins break down and provide amino acids to the blood so that these substrates can be utilized by liver for gluconeogenesis do you think all this is required we don't want it because already whatever glucose we have due to severe deficiency of insulin we cannot yes. use it at the top liver is behaving in a very very stupid way that it is providing us with additional glucose is that right am i clear and it is not enough the worst thing will happen here with the fat cells normally what fat cells are doing the fat cells are normally storing the triglycerides you know in the fat cells glycerol bind with the three fatty acids you know that and fats are this is triglycerides normally fat cells are having a very big store of triglyceride now until now this is very important to understand normally what happen when insulin is there listen carefully when insulin is there then glucose transporters are also there in the adipose cells and glucose is coming in and this glucose is utilized to synthesize glycerol and then fatty acids are attacked with them so normally what happen i'm talking about normal first normally what happen when you have eaten your food glucose level in the blood goes up insulin level also goes up and this insulin mediated entry of the glucose in the fat cells help in the synthesis of glycerol and eventually synthesis of triglyceride is that right now there is a very naughty enzyme here this enzyme loves to break down triglycerides into glycerol and free fatty acids and in this way blood can be provided with glycerol and free fatty acid this is called lipo what is the name of this enzyme at least tell me this is lipase because it is breaking the lipids <laughs> at least tell me what is it this is lipase okay so what is this this is lipase right now this enzyme the special type of lipase which can break down the triglycerides into glycerol and free fatty acid its full name is lipo lipoprotein lipase lpl lipoprotein lipase listen now carefully when it is not hormone sensitive lipase that is something different it is a different enzyme so this is special type of lipase which is present within the adipocytes and when you have eaten good food and insulin level the high this is off this is not working this will become active when insulin is dangerously low and counter regulatory hormones are dangerously high and this is where the real real trouble of diabetic ketoacidosis start that in very severe deficiency of insulin no glucose is trickling in in this severe deficiency of insulin can glucose go in no because in adipose cell glucose entry is insulin dependent when no insulin is no glucose is going in right this gives signal that there is severe deficiency of glucose in the blood so lipoprotein lipase is activated actually counter regulatory hormone epinephrine and glucagon they have a powerful stimulating action on lipoprotein lipase so deficiency of insulin and elevation of counter regulatory hormone stimulate lipoprotein lipase strongly and very rapid and severe breakdown of triglyceride start we call it severe rapid 
lipolysis start. What starts? Lipolysis. And this is something which is very important to understand. In the severe deficiency of in the severe deficiency of insulin, lipolysis will start. Actually, that is why at least a small amount of insulin is always required to prevent lipolysis. For example, if someone has deficiency of insulin, if deficiency of insulin is mild or moderate, right, glucose will not be utilized. But in moderate and mild deficiency of insulin, the little insulin which is present, it keeps on preventing the lipolysis. But in very severe insulin deficiency, the very special problem which occurs is onset of triggering of lipolysis. Angiolin type 1 diabetes is very severe deficiency of insulin. So lipolysis can occur more often in type 1 diabetes. In type 2 diabetes, deficiency of insulin is mild to moderate. So glucose utilization is impaired in type 2. But lipolysis may not start. Is that clear? Now, why this is so important to understand lip lipolysis? Actually, body was working in a normal fashion that whenever glucose is less, insulin is less, of course, lipolysis should start to provide the glycerol and provide free fatty acid for the gluconeogenesis. But here, the body is fooled. Your intelligent system is fooled because glu glucose deficiency is not there. There is only deficiency of insulin right and glucose is unable to trickle into these cells in spite of the fact there is a lot of glucose outside and total absence of glucose from these cells ex, uh, triggers the lipolysis lot of fatty acid come here now these fatty acids they go to the liver these free fatty acid go to the liver cells free fatty acids now the fatty acid load in the liver becomes so heavy that all of them cannot be utilized in gluconeo, uh, gluconeogenesis. So all those extra fatty acids which are being loaded on the liver and which cannot be utilized properly, those fatty acids will be, of course, through multiple steps, they will be taken into mitochondria. And from the mitochondria, what will come out? Ketone bodies. Ketone bodies. Again, listen. Liver cells have their own capability of handling the load of fatty acids. If fatty acid load on the liver become very heavy, right? What they do with lot of extra fatty acid, they will bind those fatty acid with the acetyl CoA and they will make acyl fatty acid. And these fatty acids will be transported with CoA attached with carnitine system transported into mitochondria and mitochondria of liver will eventually break down these fatty acids into ketone bodies. Now what are ketone bodies? What are ketone bodies? And when ketone bodies start forming by the liver and liver is secreting now ketone bodies in the blood, we say the process of ketogenesis has started. What is the process? process of ketogenesis. What was the dangerous thing here? The onset of ketogenesis. How ketogenesis start due to very severe deficiency of insulin and excess of counter regulatory hormone. Lipolysis start provide lot of free fatty acid to the blood which flood the liver and liver is overwhelmed and cannot handle these free fatty acid for gluconeogenesis and shunt lot of fatty acid to the pathway of ketogenesis. So ketones start forming in the body. Now ketones are, just yes, please, can you tell me? Beta hydroxy butyric acid, number one. Number two, aceto, aceto acetic acid, acetate, aceto acetate or acetic acid. Number three, acetone. Out of these three, which is the most abundant in the blood? Beta hydroxy butyric acid is most abundantly produced. Very good. I am impressed by your knowledge. Right. Very good. You are right. Now you have to tell me 
out of these three which one is not having keto growth i will be thoroughly impressed now beta hydroxybutyric acid very good beta hydroxybutyric acid does not have keto growth but anyway because it's a breakdown product from the s2 acetate we still call it as a ketone body is that right why this is so important to know because nitroprusside tablets and steps by which we check the ketone bodies those nitroprusside loaded sticks check actually acetoacetate they do not check the beta hydroxy butyric acid but anyway but for an average doctor ketone bodies include beta hydroxy butyric acid acetoacetate and acetone is it right but truly uh, these two have keto group and this one does not have it but anyway conventionally we put all of them as ketone bodies now these ketone bodies are actually acids it means they are loaded with protons it means when more and more ketone bodies are coming to the blood you are adding acid to the blood we are adding protons to the blood and ph start falling now as more and more protons are coming there protons are high very dangerous and body should have a defense mechanism to stabilize its own ph when these protons are coming right body should defend itself against the accumulation of protons how body defends itself what is the most important defense mechanism when in your body some dangerous acids are produced there are chances very rapidly ph will go down because high concent very high concentration of protons will damage the enzymes very high level this and very high level of protons take the ph very low at very low ph proton concentration is very high there severe acidosis and protons react with many proteins including the enzymes there are many enzymes in our metabolic pathways which are proton concentration sensitive or which are ph sensitive so these protons these enzymes will stop working and metabolism and body will shut down so it is extremely important to keep the ph of the body stabilized and body really have multiple very efficient mechanism to defend the body ph against major fluctuations so naturally now there is a threat to ph that acids are being produced by the liver and pumped into blood right chances are there lot of protons are released and ph will dangerously go down so what is the first defense here to prevent the major drop in ph a uh, uh, drop in uh, yes potassium. potassium okay there are multiple mechanism he is telling actually there should be two things number one is the bicarbonate number two is the potassium actually your blood is having a high concentration of bicarbonate right normally bicarbonate concentration is 30 milli 25 to normal person has about 25 24 25 you know 22 to 27 is the range 25 milli equivalents per liter of bicarbonate is that right so body has a good concentration of bicarbonate in the body fluid extracellular fluid now what happen when you are loading the protons there bicarbonate will react with protons and convert into carbonic acid and carbonic acid will break down into water and carbon dioxide so what has happened that actually as protons are coming to the blood listen carefully as pro acid is ketone bodies are coming it means keto acids are coming it means protons are coming protons react this is the acid react with the alkali alkali is our normal natural alkali is bicarbonate so protons and bicarbonate react make h2co3 carbonic acid which dissociate into carbon dioxide and water about water you don't worry you will piss it off what about carbon dioxide which is the most important organ to get the carbon dioxide out of the body lungs so actually as your body will undergo acidotic conditions right this acidosis will stimulate the respiratory centers here remember mild acidosis stimulate the respiratory center 
severe acidosis depresses it. Is that right? Now, actually, when carb more and more acid is coming, more and more acid is destroying, destroying our bicarbonate. So, very dangerous acid is reacting with bicarbonate and body is sacrificing the bicarbonate in a process of converting highly dangerous acid into a relatively relatively less acidic gas. What is less acidic gas? CO2. And this gas can be rapidly puffed out of the lungs. So what really happens? This will stimulate your respiratory system. So as more and more acidosis occur, there is more and more stimulation of respiratory centers in medulla, especially inspiratory center. And person breathing become what is this type of breathing which specially seen in very severe acidotic patients? Kusmal's breathing. Kusmal's breathing pattern. Actually, and when initially tachypnea develops, respiratory rate becomes fast. But in Kusmal's breathing, especially tidal volume increase. Tidal volume increase means inspiratory center work very strong and patient take deep sighing breathing is that right so we call it also acidotic breathing is that right or kusmal's breathing so you understand what is happening that ketone bodies are providing protons which are reacting with carbonic acid producing a lot of carbon dioxide carbon dioxide can cross cross the blood brain barrier in central nervous system it stimulate respiratory centers and respiration process is stimulated sometimes it's so severely pathologically stimulated that there's kusmal's breathing pattern. So this is an attempt to get the carbon dioxide out of body. But actually what we are trying here, we are trying to reduce the, trying to neutralize the acid by giving the sacrifice of bicarb bicarbonate and getting the produced uh, carbon dioxide out through the lungs by overstimulation of lung respiratory system. Is that right? Now. Due to this reason, some of these ketone bodies, protons are neutralized in this way and pH does not fall as much as much it could fall if ketone bodies were not reacting with bicarbonate. Is that right? Now, during this respiratory process, you must be knowing that acetone is a gas. Acetone is a gas. So, acetone can also go out through the lungs. So, this acetone will appear in your patient's breath and it is a very special order. You can smell acetone, right? It is called sweet fruity smell. The only way to know how it smells is smell it, <laughs> right? So the doctors who have experience, capability of recognizing that this sweet fruity smell of the acetone and right, they can make this diagnosis very, very rapidly. The two classical signs of diabetic ketoacidosis are two classical signs are acetone in breath, sweet fruity smell, order in the breath and cosmol's breathing. Very good. I think you look like a something specialist in DK. Is that right? Very good. You have given a lot of right answers. Now, so what we are talking about these two classical features will come. Cosmol's breathing with fruity smell in or expired air. Is that right? Now, the thing is that, that during all this process, bicarbonate level in the blood is going down. Bicarbonate level in the blood is going down. So what has happened up to now? Listen carefully. Up to now, number one, when insulin was deficient, blood glucose level goes? Yes. Plasma glucose level was up. For example, it is more than always, more in this situation, more than 250 milligram per dia. Right? It may be up. Number two reason what is there is that pH of the, because ketones are produced, so pH is less than 7.3. And of course, with that, what about bicarbonate? Level of bicarbonate will be down, very good, you are very educated people, yes, bicarbonate is less than 15 milli 
equivalent per letter. Is that right? And if you check in the blood, the ketone bodies are, ketone level in the blood is more than 5 millimole per liter. These four are the classical essentials of diagnosis of DKA. You understand from where these features are produced. The classical essentials of diagnosis of DKA are that patient should have glucose more than 250. You will do arterial blood gases and you will know that pH should be or less than 7.3 or, or 7.3 or less than 7.3 bicarbonate should be less than 15 milli equivalent per liter and ketone bodies should be more than 5 millimole per liter. This is diabetic ketoacidosis until proved otherwise and of course it won't be proved. <laughs> is that right? Because you have already proved it is diabetic ketoacidosis if these four things are there. Now let's see what really happens there. We have already discussed high glucose is due to multiple reasons. Number one, insulin deficiency and non-utilization of glucose, impaired utilization of glucose by the peripheral tissue. Number two, in glucose were high because glu glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis is triggered. Number three, and of course, like due to very severe deficiency of insulin and high level of glucagon, there is triggering of lipolysis. A breakdown of lipid produce, uh, released so much free fatty acid that liver was overwhelmed and it started releasing ketone bodies and pH start going down. pH start going down and ketone bodies in the blood start going up. And these ketones, many of their protons were neutralized with bicarbonate, bicarbonate went down. Any problem up to here? There's no. Another way to deal with the proton was that you know all the many cells in our body are having proton potassium exchangers. The special pump in the membrane they are called potassium proton exchangers. Whenever in your blood protons go up, of course they go up in acidotic conditions, right? Whatever the reason if proton level in the blood will go up, due because protons are in very high concentration, so protons will start moving into cells. So that protons were initially buffered in the blood with bicarbonate. Then protons can be taken into cells. There they will be buffered by intracellular buffers. Right? But in exchange of this, what will come out? Potassium. So what really happened? In this acidotic condition, protons are number one being neutralized by bicarbonate and some of the protons are entering into the cells and what is coming out is potassium and this potassium is producing hyperkalemia. So many of these patients who come early in the diagnosis, when patient comes initially potassium level is normal or up. But here I will explain later but it is very important to understand during the treatment during the proper treatment, potassium level tend to fall down. So if patient does not die initially with hyperkalemia, with aggressive treatment, you may kill the patient with hypokalemia. This is very important trick in management of this. Many patients who come with DKA, initially the proton level, is, uh, sorry, initially the they may have hyperkalemia. And if you do proper treatment of these patients, proper treatment is you give fluid replacements, you give the insulin and you give the, uh, what is this, uh, and balance of the, balance of the electrolyte also you take care, right? Now what really happens that when you are doing, when patient come initially, usually potassium level is high in the blood. But if you do proper treatment, potassium level will definitely start falling. So it means in this disease, the biphasic situation with potassium level. The most of the patient come with high potassium level and they have a risk of cardiac complications due to hyperkalemia and if you are a wonderful doctor, you very aggressively give insulin, never give aggressively. That will kill the patient. Is that right? This insulin will, should be given gradually. Right? We will discuss in the management of DKA. 
But if some doctor, young doctor, very enthusiastic, he say, okay, my patient has glucose of 400 milligram, I give a heavy insulin, and you see very rapidly, I bring the glucose level from 400 to 150 milligram. This such aggressive treatment, you can correct the hyperglycemia rapidly, but you precipitate hypokalemia also, and you will have a patient with absolutely normal glucose level with cardiac arrhythmia and death. Is that right? Cardiac arrhythmia and death. Again, let me repeat it. It is not the during the decay, it's not the high glucose which kill the patient. What really kill the patient are two things. What are those two things? Three things which kill the patient, which can really kill the patient during DKA. Number one is 